Before we get started, I'm really excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Have you ever Googled yourself and was surprised to see your personal information displayed on one of those public listing sites? It's unbelievable what comes up. These are caused by data brokers that are making a fortune selling your information to robocallers, spammers and others who want to learn more about you. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your info and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. The brokers are legally required to remove your information if you ask them to, but they make it super hard to do. But you can let Aura handle it for you. You can try Aura free for two weeks using my link, aura.com slash crimereal. You also get access to the Aura app. It's really easy to set up so you don't have to download several different apps. To get things such as parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. You get everything at one affordable price. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. At this moment, Aura is only available in the US. So remember, go to aura.com slash crimereal to start your two week free trial. And now on with the case. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the case of Peter and Monica Taylor, a married couple from the United Kingdom. Monica and Peter married in 1948, when Monica was 19 years old and Peter was 21. The couple had two children together, Susan and Graham, and they worked together running a hotel. The hotel was known as the Costa del Sol Hotel in Bournemouth on the south coast of England. Bournemouth is sometimes known as the retirement capital of the UK, with an older than average population enjoying the, at least for England, preferable climate and slower pace of life. Married for over three decades, the couple seemed to have a good marriage, at least it appeared that way. In reality, Peter was an abusive husband and by the early 1980s the couple were embroiled in an acrimonious divorce. Initially, Monica was devastated at the prospect of the divorce and fought to save her marriage. It took an extreme toll on her mental health and she attempted to take her own life in April 1980. She was found in time, an ambulance was called and she was hospitalised for a period of approximately one month both for her own safety and to aid in her recovery. The couple continued to live in the hotel whilst their divorce was being processed and the financial settlement was being thrashed out. As their marriage deteriorated, there were numerous arguments over how their assets should be divided. By the following April 1981, Monica was again in a very dark place and made a second attempt on her life. According to friends and employees, she was extremely shaken up by the divorce, but as 1981 moved to 1982, her mental health improved. She accepted the imminent divorce and was determined to get her fair share of the business that they had grown together. On Friday the 2nd of April 1982, Monica was due to have a hair appointment at 10.30 in the morning and afterwards was headed then to a meeting with her estranged husband in the hotel where they both still lived. She didn't arrive for either appointment. Concerned for her mother's safety, particularly in light of the events of the previous two Aprils, Susan notified the police. When the authorities interviewed Peter, he explained that the couple were amicable despite their estrangement and he expressed concern for Monica's welfare. The police found Monica's room to be tidy and well kept, but there were family photographs scattered across the bed. Peter painted a picture of a woman with severe mental health problems and detailed Monica's previous attempts to end her life. He presented himself as a soon-to-be ex-husband, concerned, but unable to help with his wife's struggles. From the outset of the investigation, the police suspected foul play in Monica's disappearance. Peter came under scrutiny as the prime suspect. However, with no trace of Monica, either alive or dead, it was extremely difficult to gather any concrete evidence against him. Whispers of his involvement in her disappearance were rife in the local community and the police continued to investigate, determined to uncover the truth. They found Monica's diaries that catalogued years of domestic abuse and also noted that the couple were due to attend court a few days after her disappearance in order to resolve their ongoing financial dispute. 
There were many suspicious circumstances, but no evidence to link Peter to Monica's disappearance, and she remained listed as a missing person for the following two years. Meanwhile, Peter moved on with his life. After Monica's disappearance, he began living with a younger language student from Venezuela named Rosa. The pair would later go on to marry. In 1984, two years after Monica's disappearance, a breakthrough in the case came when the police arrested a man by the name of Louis Matthews on burglary charges. Louis was a long-time associate of Peter's, going back to the 1950s when the pair of them used to steal cars together. Louis recounted a story of when Peter bought the hotel in the 1960s and there were two sitting tenants detailing how he and Peter terrorised the tenants until they left the building. He also told the police how Peter had left a dead rat in Monica's room in an attempt to get her to leave the hotel. An incident that was backed up and supported by her diary entries. Louis detailed how Peter was well known in the local criminal circles and was involved with selling stolen goods. But most damning of all, Louis told the police how, two years earlier, Peter had offered him £500 to murder his wife. According to Louis, Peter said that his estranged wife had to have an accident, but he did not want to do it himself. Peter suggested that Monica could be drugged and that someone could later return and hit her on the head. He went on to say that the body could be disposed of in the sea, in the New Forest or a Cornish mine shaft. Louis declined the offer. A few weeks later, Monica disappeared. When questioned about this, Peter dismissed the claims as rubbish. Whilst he was polite at first, he soon became quite angry and said that his wife was probably alive and just messing with him and the police could not prove otherwise. Unfortunately, the police lacked enough evidence to charge Peter with any crime. It would simply come down to the word of Louis, a known criminal, against Peter, who at least on the surface was a respectable businessman. Nine years after Monica's disappearance, another shocking development unfolded. The police uncovered a plot to murder a man by the name of Howard Smith. Howard was married to Susan Smith, who was Peter's daughter. It would seem that Peter had conspired with his daughter, 42-year-old Susan, to murder her husband. The similarities between this case and the disappearance of Monica could not be ignored. Once again, marriage difficulties, arguments over financial settlements and a pending court hearing were at the centre of the crime. Peter spoke to two men, Derek and Martin, to arrange the killing. He agreed to pay £15,000 to have the murder carried out. He made a down payment of £2,000, gave the men a map of the area around Howard's house and a photograph of his daughter and her husband. He then arranged for his son-in-law to be killed whilst out walking his dog on the cliffs near his home in Tavistock, Devon. They agreed a code word of teacher and Susan telephoned Derek when it was time for the murder to go ahead. Derek got the code word and confirmed that she wanted to go ahead, then hung up the phone. However, unknown to Peter and Susan, the two men that they had recruited to kill Howard were, in fact, undercover detectives. Within minutes, both Peter and Susan had been arrested. Not only would they both be charged with conspiracy to murder Howard, but Peter would also be charged with Monica's murder. During a conversation with the undercover detectives, Peter revealed that it was not his first time committing a murder, saying to them, I would do it myself. It would not be the first time, and added that he and his daughter would be elsewhere at the time of the killing, just like last time. The police had long suspected Peter's involvement in Monica's disappearance, but this confession provided the vital evidence that they needed. In 1993, 11 years after Monica's disappearance, 65-year-old Peter stood trial for his wife's murder at Winchester Crown Court. Despite Monica's body never having been found, the evidence against Peter was overwhelming. Peter denied killing Monica, with his defence stating that she may either still be alive and living abroad or had taken her own life. Both Peter and Susan admitted to conspiring to murder Susan's husband. Susan who was the mother of eight-year-old twins, 
described at the hearing how she had been psychologically terrorised by her husband. During the divorce proceedings, they remained living in the same house and she described him as unbalanced, obsessive, sexually deviant and cruel and Susan was terrified of what he might do to her and their children. After just two hours of deliberation, the jury found Peter guilty of Monica's murder as well as soliciting Louis Matthews to commit murder and conspiring with his daughter to murder her husband. Peter received a life sentence for Monica's murder with concurrent sentences for the other charges. He still refused to admit his guilt and Monica's body has never been found. It was accepted by the court that Susan knew nothing of the events of 1982 when her father killed her mother but she was found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. The judge said that ordinarily a substantial prison sentence would be given for her crimes but due to the exceptional circumstances surrounding her case she received a hospital order under the Mental Health Act. That concludes today's story. Please add any comments down below. Thank you for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. Channel 5 did a documentary on this case called Murder by the Sea, The Hotelier and the Hitman. Goodbye.